The aria is the jewel in the crown of opera, the moment when the solo singer has the chance to take center stage. The moment when great composers bring all the emotion and drama of their story to a head. For Puccini, it could be your tiny frozen hand. For Mozart's Don Giovanni, notches on the bedpost. For Verdi, it might be railing against a cruel god. The arias will become the pop songs of the day. Those words you can't forget. The melody becoming an earworm that won't leave you alone. I'm Antonio Papano, and as music director at the Royal Opera House, I get to conduct the greatest singers, delivering these magical arias that are the cornerstones of every opera. The German composer Richard Strauss said that the aria was the soul of an opera. And I agree, they carry the emotional weight of an evening in the theater. And they let the singers sing their hearts out to you, literally. Together, we'll find out how the aria grew from humble beginnings to become an essential part of any operatic drama to this very day. And with help from some great performers of the past and my singing colleagues of today, I want to unpick some of my favorite arias and celebrate what makes them so special. So, what is an aria? Well, simply, it is a number sung by a solo singer, accompanied or not. But they're not just pretty songs. Arias perform a real function in opera, and they come in all shapes and sizes. We have the entrance aria, the introduction of a character. He throws down the gauntlet. We find out what he's about why he's there. The romantic utterance, the most well-known kind of aria. The exit aria the death scene, gut-wrenching. <laughs> Importantly, arias enable the key characters to address us directly. A musical soliloquy that reveals less about plot and more about the innermost thoughts and feelings of a given character. By revealing themselves through their arias, these characters draw us, the audience, right into the heart of the drama. In a way, opera has become largely defined by these musical highlights. And we shouldn't forget the singer, too. These arias give these virtuoso artists a chance to show off their vocal prowess and wow an audience.
The aria is one of the fundamental pillars of any opera, but how it came to be and how it evolved is a really interesting story because 400 years ago in Italy when opera started, there were no arias at all. Late Renaissance Florence was the place to be for an artist or composer. The singing voice was heard mainly in church or at court, but it was a small group of musicians and poets who, inspired by their love of mythology, sought to find a way for music and drama to meet. The works they created and the word opera, literally meaning work, took hold. A new form of entertainment had arrived. These early works were practically all plot, conveyed by sung speech or recitativo. As the singers demanded more chances to show off their vocal virtuosity, the composers indulged them. Amongst the text-heavy plot, the composers created formal interludes or oases so the singers could spread their wings. The popularity of opera spread throughout Italy and it was in Venice that one composer was to really exploit these interludes where the plot paused to reveal something more reflective in the drama. Claudio Monteverdi. In this scene from Monteverdi's coronation of Poppea, we find Emperor Nero plotting with his mistress Poppea. They are conversing freely, but then Monteverdi halts the banter. Dramatically, he stops time, the orchestra introducing something quite different for Nero to deliver. That was an aria, a specific expression of feelings in four short bars. So we have this beautiful expression of the depth of the soul. In un sospir, sospir che vien dal profondo nel sen. So you have this, um, and profondo is expressed by a falling fifth. Dal profondo nel sen. Four bars of beautiful aria. We're back into a, a conversation and it, it adds to the psychological interest of the character. The essence of an aria is a reflection, is a moment out of time, if you like. Um, a pensive moment, a, a joyful moment, an angry moment, whatever. A reality to how this character feels. Aria offered a new psychological perspective on the drama. It wasn't about pushing the story forward. With Monteverdi, opera had found its true voice. Over the decades that followed, composers seized this opportunity to let loose their musical and dramatic imagination, creating oases of emotion in the aria. The aria would grow in length, revealing an enormous variety of feelings. Sometimes 10 minutes of soul searching, a long way from Monteverdi's four bars. By the end of the 17th century, opera had taken hold all over Europe. Naples, Paris, Vienna and London 
became major operatic centers, and the aria had developed into a popular and recognizable form. And it was in London that one of the greatest composers of his age would use this new form to take his dramas to another level. George Frederick Handel came from Germany and in 1723 made his home in the heart of Mayfair. Beethoven considered Handel the greatest composer that ever lived. That's <laughs> saying something. There's no question that his contribution to opera in general and the aria in particular sets him apart. Handel perfected a type of aria called da capo, perfect for showing off a great voice. It has an ABA structure. The A section is the tune. Then a contrasting section, the B section. And then you come back to the original tune. But it was expected that the performer would embellish the tune this time. Improvising to dress up the melody. Now, as a concept, it's deceptively simple, but these da capo arias become complex psychological journeys. And the greater the aria, the, the more arduous the journey. I love the expanded time to explore one emotion. I love nine minutes of this psychological uh, journey that you go where you are absolutely not the same character at the end of those nine minutes is incredible. In particular, Handel, he does this better than any other composer for me. For me, Handel's greatest achievements are his slow arias. They literally stop time, creating moments of profound introspection, like this aria sung by Cleopatra when she believes Caesar, whom she is in love with, has died. Now, by any measure, that is a beautiful melody. Yeah. One of the reasons I think it's... it's such a profound journey in even just in these three pages of music is because this is a powerful woman who has been um, knocked off her center of potency and dominance in a way. And at the beginning, she's saying, I, yes, I, I will weep. I, it's the only thing left for me is to weep, but I still want revenge. And it's also exquisitely beautiful, which makes the pain somehow more acute. What started out as now becomes enormous jump. Yeah. And these, this reaching and the effort of reaching gives the feeling of pain, obviously. Ah. Handel creates stillness. Yeah. And the, but he often breaks that with a B section. And the contrast here is just enormous. What was that? 
Oh, read. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not written. It's not written. So it's no. a, it's. We put in a little cadenza here because normally it finishes. The fact that the music has stopped gives me liberty to yes. then sort of exactly. And what I love is going back up with a yeah. So it's not just da da, but I need to reach one more time because the pain is so acute. Da. And then. Fatto spettro oggi. The other liberty that I think it gives me is to truly use every uh, color in my voice. It's an enormous kaleidoscope that's required to really bring this music to life. And uh, it requires everything that I, I am as a musician and, a, and an actress, and I love it. <laughs> <It's> true. <laughs> And as the A section repeats, now the singer adds her own ornamentation to the melody to create yet another layer of emotional depth, from self-pity through anger to full resignation of her fate. In short, a real aria. But Handel and every other composer that came after him realized that the aria could be used to deliver not only internal psychology, but also quickly establish a character with the maximum impact. Sure, you can look in the program for the name of the character, the singer, but it's the entrance aria that establishes musically, vocally, stylistically, and theatrically the essence of this character. This is a classic entrance aria from Mozart's Magic Flute, designed to tell us all about Papageno, the bird catcher. His character and desires are all there, both in the words and in the music. Rustic, folksy, light and carefree, you can't help but warm to him. Though initially influenced by the da capo style, Mozart went on to perfect the aria. His music became very precisely written, yet all the reflections and emotions are there in the notes. It's done so skillfully, it seems like child's play. This is a fragment of the manuscript of Mozart's Marriage of Figaro. It's Cherubino's first act aria, Non so più cosa son cosa faccio. It's perfect. It was all there in his head. Cherubino, played here by mezzo-soprano Rinat Shaham, is an adolescent, love-obsessed page boy who falls for every girl he meets. Mozart gives him an aria where the music brilliantly reflects all the excitement of the text. The words are this. Non so più cosa son cosa faccio. Or di fuoco, ora sono di ghiaccio. Ogni donna cangiar di colore, ogni donna mi fa palpitar. And this is how Mozart has set it, creating an amazing, breathless accompaniment underneath. It's almost sung on the breath. It's almost as if the singer can't, uh, can't get the words out quick enough. Tell 
cunningly on the word donna, every woman makes me palpitate. He goes, he uses two notes. Ogni donna, donna. And it's a subtle thing, but there's a, the slightest lingering that is, I think, the work of genius. <laughs> And it's a fantastic portrayal of this mischievous little troublemaker. I see this rascal Cherubino as Mozart himself. There's such mischief in it. And uh, they say Mozart was extremely mischievous. Just read his letters. This is him. But at the other end of the scale, Mozart could also do heartbreak. Here, Gundula Janowitz is Pamina, who sings this aria when Tamino seemingly rejects her love. This aria demands all the artistry of the performer, as the simplicity of the accompaniment leaves the singer very exposed. There's a tragic air. In this, in this piece, you probably won't notice the accompaniment much, except until you hear chords like this. Like this. Against that, it's an extraordinary melody, always descending, imitating tears and with enormous leaps. Listen very, very carefully to those leaps because vocally they are treacherous and they need incredible poise and incredible musicality to make them seem absolutely natural. but it's the way he uses harmony and surprising elements, like all of a sudden bursting out with Don't you feel my love? And going up creating Unbelievable contrast. Simple melody allied with rich, telling harmonies. She talks about death expressed. We'll only have rest in death. Only Mozart could pull that off and somehow convince you that these leaps, the stress of the leap, really reveals all the emotion, all the depth of feeling. 
all the despair. While Mozart's music so easily achieves naturalistic emotions in his arias, one corner of the repertoire revels in the singer's technique, putting the voice itself at the front and center of the drama. An exuberance of vocal prowess designed to wow audiences. I'm talking about the works of Rossini, Donizetti and Bellini, who dominated opera at the beginning of the 19th century. We now call this the bel canto, literally beautiful singing. For Rossini, the bel canto voice was comprised of three essential elements. Firstly, the voice itself, what he called the Stradivarius. Even today, a byword uh, for pure, subtle and ringing tone. Then we have technique, the singer's skill. And thirdly, the singer's taste and feeling. For the tenor Lawrence Brownlee, this aria by Donizetti offers a chance to showcase these elements like few others. It's an aria of longing sung by the character Ernesto, who decides to leave home, believing he has lost the girl of his dreams. I think you see the longing, you hear the sighing, you, you hear the pain in his voice. And you somehow managed to make it incredibly smooth and convincing, and, and at the same time, it has a pathetic quality. We want to feel sorry for you. <laughs> Absolutely. Ah, oh, there's a, uh, yeah. Amazing line. Now, it, it, when I say line, it's a continuity of tone, as if the melody was endless. But what you're doing is you're, you're singing these notes. You're yes. creating this flow, almost of lava. Yes. And I... yet you're creating sympathy by singing those accents. Mm. I mean, if we follow what's the direction of the line and some of the dynamics, I think it's some of the places are slightly different and it brings out different colors in the voice, I think it does. So in other words, it is this playing with the colors, Absolutely. playing with the dynamics, with loud, soft, and everything in between. <laughs> But it's not just purity and color of tone. A good vocal technique is key because these bel canto blockbusters so often end with a big bang finale. And the traditional bel canto ending. Creating expectation from the public. That's what I wanted. You don't have to To the end. <laughs> to the end. The other trademark of these bel canto arias is that they are designed to give the performer a chance to thrill us with improvised vocal fireworks. Aha, a throwback. But to give this real meaning, it's up to the singer. Take this aria by Rossini, where we find Queen Semiramide in the throes of anxious anticipation while waiting for her lover to return. The 
emphasis on bel canto is all about the voice, and we think, you know, just streams of perfectly pearl-shaped tones. And the thing for me is I can't understand the vocality until I know why I'm singing a line. And this, it starts with the text, and then we go to the layer underneath, which is the subtext of what that character is searching for, what it's announcing, what they're um, figuring out. And now... Wow, now that's the coloratura, coloring, the embellishing, the virtuosity that we've been waiting for. Mm. So, bel canto singing is as much about interpretation, as much about making the expression and the music personal to the performer, as it is about beautiful singing. Now, with all these great arias, there's a middle section. You repeat exactly the same music uh, verbatim, but it's not. Now, done with extreme good taste, these kind of little variations are expected uh, in this music. And when you have a great colorist as vocalist, then we're talking about endless possibilities. These arias were unashamedly audience crowd-pleasers. In fact, whole operas were designed around these moments where the singers could fly. In all the arias we've looked at so far, the story stopped and the singer would stand and deliver, audiences expecting to be wowed. But one composer conceiving a totally new approach to the opera experience would redefine how the aria sat within the drama, creating for audiences a total and immersive theatrical experience. Richard Wagner's theatrical vision, which he called Gesamtkunstwerk, was on such a scale that he built his own opera house in the German town of Bayreuth to accommodate it. There was an uninterrupted view of the stage and a vast orchestra pit hidden from view. Nothing should interrupt the flow and concentration of the drama, not even the arias. Wagner believed that the aria should be part of the continuous theatrical flow. Well, what does that mean, really? Well, his arias would somehow emerge So in this entrance aria from The Flying Dutchman, here sung by Bryn Tervel, the music and drama are intrinsically linked, seamlessly pushing forward. Composing in the mid-1800s, Wagner's approach to music drama was shockingly new. Here, the orchestra is an equal partner to the singer. There were no beginnings and no endings to his arias. You were brought through in this continuous flow.
The power of Wagner is that along with enormous psychological depth, there's also plot. Everything is integrated. And after almost 10 minutes, he gives us no space for a round of applause. The drama must move on. So theater is paramount and aria always in a given context, always adding one notch to the theatrical tension. Wagner brought a new sophistication to the aria, and his direct contemporary in Italy, another titan of the opera world, did the same, albeit in a very different way. I'm talking, of course, about Giuseppe Verdi. Verdi's arias are meticulously constructed to heighten the emotional state of the characters, not only in what he asks the singers to do, but what he asks of the orchestra. The combined effect doubles the impact, no, quadruples the impact. Take Verdi's portrait of a young girl in this love aria from his opera Rigoletto, sung here by Lucy Crow. Listen to the sighing flutes of the introduction. Gilda is 16 years old. The Duke has captured her heart. On one level, this could seem just a pretty tune, but subtly, underneath, there's so much more going on. Caranome is really a sexual awakening. So Verdi shows us his genius for this aria in a number of ways. He shows her passion and her sexual awakening by using lots of pauses. There's a pause after each note, which is her feeling that incredible feeling in her lower part of her body. I mean, she can hardly sing it because she's so excited. Verdi writes many pauses on top notes. So what he creates is this sense of, we've got the pulse in the orchestra in these beautiful, simple woodwind lines. But then all of a sudden we have to hold it and it's like she's holding her breath. So we get this push and pull, which is her heart and her heartbeat and her excitement and her, her ecstasy within her body. Verdi applied this Italianate psychological approach to most of his operas, looking for subjects that, through music, would really explore the motivations of his characters. Here at Sant'Agata, Verdi's home in northern Italy, he kept the works of Shakespeare by his bedside, his plays being the source for three of Verdi's most important works, Macbeth, Falstaff, and what for me really showcases Verdi's vision, Otello. Together with his much younger librettist, Arrigo Boito, Verdi created a claustrophobic psychological drama with expertly drawn characters that, importantly, redefined the structure, emphasis, and delivery of the aria itself. Never more so than in this scene sung by Piero Capuccilli, where Iago, surely one of the darkest villains in opera, reveals his evil heart. What I think is fascinating about this aria is its total lack of melody. It's 
completely declamatory from beginning to end. And what is incredible about it is the dialogue between him and the orchestra. It says, well, the orchestra is him. This is... sounds like v vermin and worms and this is the evil in his soul <laughs> can't say this is melody really but it is tremendously frightening I was born evil with trills and snarling orchestra there Almost shouting he is with these horrible chords. Listen out for the many outbursts from the orchestra and from the singer that take you completely by surprise. There's a, a mocking figure that he uses. Now mockingly he sings this. I think Piero Cappuccilli is actually singing with incredible intelligence and if you notice with incredible focus, projection of tone, the declamation of the text and the expression in his face get to know somebody's insides. Here we really get under the skin of a character. And it's not pretty. In a funny kind of way, opera was going to get even less pretty in the closing decades of the 19th century, when a new musical movement took center stage, verismo, or realism. Stories about ordinary people, for the ordinary people. Music that, with an earthy expression, with a blood and guts approach, brings us in to the underbelly of society and creates theater that it's so much more immediate, so much more compelling and theatrical. This is vividly encapsulated in one of the most dramatic Verismo operas there is, Pagliacci, The Clowns, by Ruggero Leoncavallo, is the tragic story of a traveling troupe of players. At its center is an aria born of profound personal crisis. It's a pathetic aria and unfathomably sad. The main character, Canio, 
has discovered his younger wife's infidelities, but must nevertheless prepare for a performance that evening. For as we know, the show must go on. And if you want an example of a showstopper, this aria is it. Like Placido Domingo here, all the great tenors sing it. It has a kind of raw passion that audiences and performers cannot help but connect with. to go out no matter what is happening. As a performer, we find comfort in burying ourselves, but this is a whole nother level because it doesn't touch just me as Kanyo, but me as Brian. is a combination of a wonderful melody and the passion that the music evokes from that melody. I think it's a stroke of genius. It cuts right to the core. If Leon Cavallo brought a melodramatic realism to his arias, another composer and colleague went further bringing a more refined naturalism to his music. He was a composer that looked forward onto a new century. In fact, Giacomo Puccini was the first opera composer to be captured on a new medium, film. Puccini brought the aria into the 20th century. His operas have the feeling of a film or even a Broadway musical, musicals um, owing Puccini really a huge debt. His arias are succinct and make a real impact when they happen. Taking his cue from Richard Wagner, he integrates them into the continuous flow of the action. He draws you into a situation, creating the necessity for an aria, for this oasis of emotion. It's also inevitable. Just take this scene from La Bohème. It's the moment when Rodolfo the poet meets Mimi for the first time. Here Puccini uses the music to set the scene. It's animated, light and intimate. Mimi has lost her key, 
And as they both search for it, you can hear just how Puccini prepares the terrain for one of his most famous arias. As they unsuccessfully search for the key, you can hear the disappointment in this music. Until here, the music warms with the strings. Rodolfo has an idea. He sees her hand and touches it. She gasps. As you can see, Rodolfo is not singing to himself, nor to us. He's singing directly to Mimi. This is real theater. A very naturalistic. Puccini uses high notes strategically to create greater intensity. See how this is really a scene and an aria at the same time. So we have an aria as duet with a silent but acting partner. The sympathy that we feel for this character will be genuine, for sure. Now the real heart of the aria is here. That rising phrase, poet, as dreamer, that reckless quality, that abandon. Yes, you need a charismatic performer. Yes, you need partners that you can believe in up there on the stage. But Puccini has provided all the materials. These arias continue to be fresh thanks to the great voices reinterpreting them time and time again. Today, operas are still very much with us, new ones emerging all the time. So, what are the preoccupations of the contemporary composers? What do they do with the aria? What are they looking for? How does it function? I don't write extreme music, but then I do pick extreme subjects. I'm, I'm always looking for journey. Well, a lot of artists do, they're intensifying the drama. I like, like them to really sort of strike home uh, and, and, and to a point where, where that, that character's really defined, and they're quite often defined by an aria for me. So he won't want a kid, he's on <laughs> You make Turnage's me opera is based on a modern retelling of Oedipus Rex, Stephen Burkhoff's Greek. 
Here, the character Eddie is about to discover an appalling truth. But you're not our son. For me, it's a point where, in a way, the action stands still. I mean, of course, there are many areas where, where this doesn't happen, but for me, I have to earn my areas in the piece. So I have a lot of sort of activity pushing the story forward. And then I have a moment where the singer, sort of psychologically or whatever is going on in the opera, can really sort of reflect and, you can, and, it, and it goes, it hopefully it goes deeper. When Eddie discovers that his wife is actually his mother, he completely loses it. The aria that follows is born of deep crisis, but Turnage strips it right back. Listen. No more, oh no more. Will I taste the sweetness of my dear wife below? It's sort of an emotional moment where everything disintegrates. Unaccompanied monologue, because there's no orchestra, has to be heard and, and is there and I think makes an impact. It's standing still, but you're doing something that really draws people in. The moon turned as red as blood. If you look at older great operas, especially Puccini, some of those big arias, the famous arias, if you time them, and I used to time them quite religiously to see how long some of the arias were, they're actually quite short. They're often no more than two and a half, sometimes two minutes, and they're making a massive impact. Doesn't matter, mother. It doesn't matter. You know, in the end, you don't know what people are going to make of it. It's what you try to do, make right for yourself, and then see what happens. It's not yours anymore. You give it out to the audience. Well, I suppose at the heart of it all is the audience. 400 years ago, Monteverdi, today, Mark Turnage. They want the audiences to go home transfixed. Now, the aria plays a big part in that. And when you think that opera started with no arias at all, but today, an opera is unthinkable without the aria. So it's this visceral, from the gut, expression of emotion, connecting each one of us individually with the character on stage. This will never change, and I certainly hope it doesn't. So